Question. Would the International Space Station be deemed uninhabitable if it were held to the same radiation standards as the Fukushima Exclusion Zone? Do I get more radiation if I fly during the day or during the night? And if I include the fact that I get 30 times the background radiation when I'm on a plane, which is now safer? Flying or driving? Now, given people's inherent fear of radiation, there really are many people who would react like this when they realize they're getting 30 times the normal exposure to radiation. But when I saw these results, all I could think of is, oh my god, that is just so cool. Now, I've often read that you get about 30 times the background radiation when you're on a plane. That is, if you were to live on a plane, then you would have about a 30 times higher chance of getting cancer from radiation. It would also mean that I get more radiation exposure when I fly to a nuclear reactor to do an experiment than the actual radiation exposure I get at the reactor. But is it true? So I did what any honest scientist would do. I got myself a radiation meter and a time-lapse camera and a really, really simple setup of one pointing at the other. Now I'm measuring here in units of microsieverts per hour and background on the plane here is about 0.1. Remember that, because we're going high in every sense of the word. So here we are with the plane on the ground, and just watch what happens when we get airborne. The radiation level just goes up and up and up to a maximum of about three, which is about 30 times the background radiation on the ground. Thankfully, at this point, I'd actually turn the beeper off, because if I hadn't, this is what the meter sounds like when it's maxed out at about 50, 100 times background, that sort of thing. Um, which means that it's at least 50 times background and doubtless if I'd had the beeper actually on on the plane, half the people would be going, Oh my god, the Geiger counter's going crazy! The radiation's gonna kill us! I get my boots checked, there's nothing wrong. I get my hands checked and the Geiger meter just goes crazy. They told everybody to get back, get away from me. That just made me even more nervous and more scared. And the other half with a blank expression would just be saying, Will you just turn that damn thing off? But why am I not freaking out that I'm getting 30 times the background radiation on this plane? Well, radiation's a bit odd like that. The more of it you get exposed to, eh, the higher your chances of getting cancer. So I can see all these people turning white saying, oh my god, you're 30 times more likely to get cancer if you spend your life on a plane. Well, yes, but 30 times bugger all is still bugger all. The easiest way to understand these risks is to just compare them to the risk of, say, dying while driving. Again, there's this kind of linearity to it. The more you drive, the more likely you are to die on the roads. And it turns out that about a year's worth of background radiation gives me about the same chance of dying from cancer as driving about 1,000 miles. And seeing as your average American drives some 10,000 miles per year, that means that you're about 10 times more likely to die in a car accident on the roads than you are to die from cancer from the background radiation. Or another way of looking at it, you could live your whole life life in an area with 10 times the normal background radiation and even at that you would only have comparable chances of dying from cancer from the background radiation as you do from driving your car. So where is all this background radiation coming from? Well the universe is a radioactive place. The earth is radioactive and so is space. So when you're on the ground you get most of the radiation from the ground but you're shielded by the atmosphere from space. However, when you get up high, you're mostly shielded from the radioactivity from the Earth, but not from that of space. The high energy radiation in space is called cosmic radiation. Very little of it is local, indeed most of it is thought to be coming from supernova that happened a long, long time ago in galaxies far, far away. When we're on the ground, we're shielded from most of this stuff by the atmosphere. So when you're at sea level, the atmosphere gives you the equivalent shielding of about three meters. That's 10 or so feet of concrete from this high energy cosmic radiation. And just for the record, this is what about one foot of concrete looks like. However, as you fly progressively up in the atmosphere, you progressively lose that shielding until you get up to where the International Space Station is, which has a lot more radiation than the mere 30 times background I've got on the plane. Indeed, even at quiet solar times, you get about 90 times the background radiation on the International Space Station than you do on Earth. And just for the record, that's comparable to the areas in Fukushima deemed uninhabitable. 
Now there is some uh, local cosmic radiation from the solar wind, but thankfully we're shielded from most of this softer radiation by the Earth's magnetic field. However, that was really interesting for me because I was taking two short flights in Europe here. One was in the dark and one was in daylight. So question, should they give different levels of radiation? For me, the answer was a simple no. The majority of the high energy cosmic radiation will be constant, day or night, with most of the softer solar wind being deflected by the Earth's magnetic field. So what does it look like when we compare the radiation profiles from the night flight and the day flight side by side? And I was stunned to find they have really different profiles. These flights were very similar in the flight times. And when I plotted out the results, I just couldn't help but think, that is so cool. Could I understand why they were different? Well, no, but that's what made it so interesting. The radiation levels really didn't matter that much whether the radiation meter was mounted by the window or inside the plane. That is, the plane itself provided very little shielding from the cosmic radiation. The planes were, however, different, and although it didn't look like it, it is possible that we were actually flying at different altitudes with the different planes, or that the bigger, heavier plane climbed up higher and faster and falls faster than the lighter plane. I just don't know. All I can say is, next time, I'm taking GPS. But yeah, the bottom line is still the same. If I took this long-haul flight to a experiment at a nuclear reactor that, say, took eight hours. That's eight hours at 30 times the background radiation. So that would mean that I would need to spend some 120 hours at 10 meters from the core to get an equivalent dose to the plane flight. Or this would work out some 240 hours of background radiation. That's about eh, 10 days of background radiation. About the same risk as driving only 30 miles. <laughs> but I hear you say, but 10 days background radiation is still a needless exposure. Isn't that a needless risk? Aren't you running the risk of getting cancer needlessly? Well, let's just say for sake of argument, I've got a 3,000 mile journey to make. Well, let's compare the hazards of plane flight to those of driving. Turns out that even if I include the chances of dying in a plane crash and the chances of dying from the enhanced radiation exposure, Flying is still about 30 times safer than driving the equivalent distance. Incidentally, I would really like to thank those who have supported this channel through Patreon because you really do make videos like this possible. Sure, this is hardly Mythbuster bank breaker type budget, but it really does enable videos like this where you can actually see the increase in the cosmic radiation, not just on a day flight, but side by side with a night flight too. Because I got to be honest, when I first saw that, I just thought, oh man, that is so cool. I'm being irradiated by supernova radiation. 